Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Buckeye Weekly Podcast. I am Tony Gerdeman here, as always, with Tom Orr and also with Kevin Noon. First, Tom, how's it going? Tony, I was talking to Kevin right before we started, and I am not emotionally prepared to be at the college football playoff rankings show portion of the season. It feels like it like three weeks ago we were at Indiana for the opening game of the season, and here we are, and all of a sudden, boom, it's 70 degrees colder than it was on the field that day, and also the season's already like two-thirds over, and I don't care for it, Tony. I don't care for it at all. Yeah, podcasting, streaming at night in, in the dark is not something that I look forward to every year, but I'm glad to be here. Kevin, how are you doing? Doing well. Came home, took a nap, so my headache that people heard about in the first show has subsided a little bit. Uh, I'm just glad we're not up at Toledo right now, as Dave Briggs of the Toledo Blade posted a picture of a substantial snowstorm up there. So things could always be worse. Yeah, let's not speak that into, into existence. Right now, the weather looks pretty good for New Jersey. Don't want to speak too much on that one for this weekend, but we are all here waiting to see the first college football playoff rankings revealed in uh, maybe like the next 10 minutes. I wonder how quickly they will get to this. I can't wait to see. Tom, we talk about it every year. Let's see where the bottom of the rankings are and what kind of narrative we are already going to learn from this committee. Yeah, if you are new to this show or new to the college football playoff committee's nonsense, Our long-held theory here is that if you want to know what the committee is going to do at the top of the rankings, what the committee wants to do at the top of the rankings, the key is to look at the bottom of the rankings. Because in reality, the difference between number the 20th best team in the country and the 28th best team in the country is generally pretty much negligible. But the team that they put at 20, well, that's a top 20 win, Tony. And the team that they put at at 24, well, that's a top 25 win, Tony. And the team that they put at 28, well, who cares? That's a, that's just whatever. Like that, That's just that – you might as well have beaten UMass at that point. So, you know, if the committee wants to tell you that Georgia is the best team in the country, well, you're probably going to see Kentucky and – uh, Florida and whoever, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of the teams that are like, yeah, I don't know, maybe you could be somewhere in there. Like you'll, you'll see some of those teams pop up in the 20 to 24 range. I, you know, I don't think Georgia is going to be your number one team. And, you know, if they wanted to put Michigan number one, I guess look for Rutgers and UNLV in the 20 to 25 range. But I, I, I feel like that's, something that generally will come up more later on in the process rather than necessarily week one. Well, you don't want to, I guess, lock yourself into something week one with, with your beliefs. You kind of want to maybe keep it a little bit malleable. Plus right now, I don't, there's nobody to rank of the Georgia opponents. The, um, mm-hmm. you know, Kentucky has got no votes from the AP. I think they got one from the coaches and that's probably, Somehow Steve Spurrier, I don't know, uh, but the uh, I went through the top ten and I looked at the number of teams, the number of currently ranked teams that each of the teams in the top ten have beaten this year. How many top ten wins or top or how many ranked wins they have? Sorry, Georgia has none, of course. Uh, Michigan has none. Ohio State has two. Florida State has one. Like those are the four teams that are going to come into this thing with a claim. Maybe Washington has maybe arguably the best win, but they have not looked great since that win. But, um, you know, Oregon has one ranked win. Texas actually has two with the win over Alabama and a win over Kansas. Bama has two with a win over Ole Miss and a win over Tennessee. We'll see where those two teams are to help some sort of narrative there. Penn State, none. Oklahoma has the one ranked win over Texas as we look at ESPN right now is showing some of that <laughs> snow, I think, in, in Toledo. Uh, but if you're talking about who has who has got the resume right now, you have Ohio State with wins over the number 12 and the number 9 team. And I'm just interested to see if they value wins right now more than the eye test. And if it's Georgia, then it's clearly the eye test, and it's just, well, we just think Georgia is better. But they haven't done anything in terms of any important wins to justify being number one right now. 
Well, I don't. I think if you're going purely by the eye test, you probably put Michigan number one because Georgia and Michigan, they had a segment on uh, Sports Center five minutes before this the ranking show started. And they, you know, showed, you know, strength of strength of schedule. And Georgia was a hundredth and Michigan was 111th in the country. So it's not like Georgia has a bunch of like incredible wins that that have been, you know, that, that are so much better than anyone else's. And Michigan's Michigan has at least just taken people, taken whoever they're playing and beaten them to death with a tack hammer and rolled them in a carpet and dumped them off a bridge. That has been every single Michigan game the last month. So if you're going purely based on game control, which is one of those nonsense terms you'll hear the committee use, then it's Michigan. If you're going by resume, it's Ohio State because they have the win over Notre Dame on the road. They have the win over Penn State at home, and there's no one else that has a pair of wins like that. But, you know, I am I am guessing that this will be Ohio State number one just based on that. But you got to remember – you know, in in the next couple of weeks, Ohio State plays Rutgers, Michigan State, and Minnesota before they play Michigan at the end of the year. Michigan has to go on the road to State College to play Penn State, and then they play Maryland. So Michigan will have another you know two games that are probably probably going to be better wins than anything Ohio State's going to pick up in the next few weeks. And then good news, they play that following that Saturday following uh, Thanksgiving, and then that will all sort itself out anyway. Georgia has Missouri, the number 14, number 11, Ole Miss, number 19, Tennessee coming up. Kevin, are you expecting – What do you? who are you expecting in the, that number one spot? I think it's going to go Ohio State 1, Georgia 2, Michigan 3, FSU 4. That is my prediction. And then if we want to get really technical here, uh, Washington 5, Oregon 6, even though I think that uh, – Oregon is playing a hell of a lot better than Washington, but head-to-head matters. But I think that you have to say something about what the resume is. If Ohio State had the resume and had to, in its big wins, won by a point and had to come back like from like dramatic fashion, okay, you can sit there and say, well, maybe they stumbled into it. But when it comes down to it, I think that we're going to see a committee that's going to put more on resume than results, but that's just a guess. Tom, I like Thomas Kirkpatrick's comment here. Part of Michigan's game control is having the opponent's plays. So uh, that's, that's awful helpful there. That is the best way I've found in my experience to control the game is to know what your opponent is going to do. And uh, boom, now you've got game control. Good job, Tom. I'm going to be really interested to see, and hear what the committee has to say about the Michigan situation. And I'm guessing we're not going to hear anything real definitive, like, boy, if it's proven that they fill in the blank, then these consequences will result from that. I'm not expecting that. But, you know, is the committee taking any of that into account? Or is there a possibility that they would take any of that into account before any sort of punishment is levied? Or is it just... You know, unless if they are eligible for the postseason, then and they have not been forced to vacate or forfeit any games, that that's fine. All is fine and dandy, and they will proceed as if nothing is happening. I, my assumption is that that's going to be the answer, but it would be interesting to have them just sort of on the record explaining their thinking on that. Because if you think that you know nothing's going to happen immediately because the NCAA is not going to act in time and can't by statute act in time, will the committee take into account like, okay, well, we all know that these games are going to get vacated and it would be pretty gross if we had a national champion that we had to vacate in a matter of three months. I can't imagine that they're going to do that. So, but I, But again, I would just be interested to have them on the record explaining their thinking on that. Is that at all a factor in anything? Well, and, and the way news keeps coming out, what they say about it this week may not be what they think about it next week where something new comes out, then it's like, okay, now now we have to really start thinking hard about this because I feel like uh, initially they're probably going to just wash their hands of it and be like, oh, you know, or even our hands are tied. We have to go with who's who's currently eligible which isn't true. They can do what they want. They're their own entity. They're separate from the NCAA. Essentially they can do however, do however they want to do it. 
but I do feel like for the time being, they will, oh, we're powerless as we were first getting the, the first rankings coming in now. Oh, interesting. Well, here's, here's your, you want to do the 20 to 25 theory, uh, big 12 getting propped up, uh, 25 air force, 24 Tulane, 23 Kansas state, 22 Oklahoma state, 21 Kansas. Wow. So, you know, if we're, if we are, uh, going with this theory, Kevin did not have any big 12 teams in his top six. So if we want to ride this theory for a while, we may see more Big 12 teams in the top six than Kevin had projected, which was zero. So, again, this is uh, – let's Are not overreact. Texas, to anything. Oh, maybe? I, I, I was just about to say let's not overreact to anything, and then they have USC 20th, which, okay, all right. Uh, USC uh, 20th, UCLA 19th, Utah 18th, Tennessee 17th, Oregon State 16th, so uh, four hmm. – Big uh, four Pac-12 teams between 16 and 20. So that's we've only seen one, seen one SEC teams, no Big Ten teams, no ACC teams in the uh, 16 through 25 range. I feel like the ACC is going to get dumped on pretty good. That's just because they're bad at football. Yes, no, ju- justifiably. <laughs> um, Will North Carolina be in here somewhere? I mean, they've had some bad losses. I don't think I, – I would be surprised. After last week, I would have expected to see North Carolina at 22 or something like that. You know, mm-hmm. I, I think it would be hard to justify putting them in uh, the – you know, in the top 15. Uh, 15, Notre Dame. 14, LSU. 13, Louisville. 12, Missouri. 11, Penn State. So, so now we know how they feel about Ohio State's two wins. Yeah, Ohio State, zero top 10 wins. Are they frauds? Are they cowards? <laughs> Tony? Mm-hmm. My, my column to follow. <laughs> yes, my, my no zero top 10 wins for Ohio State. Missouri at number 12. That's uh, Did you say they played Georgia this week or next week? Uh, it's coming. Yeah, I think it's this week. Number oh, Yeah, so... So that'll yeah. be a uh, that'll be interesting to see, yeah, how how that game plays out, and then what that what that does to those te- these teams a week from now. I always feel like this this first weekend is a little bit uh, this first week is a little bit like the first practice of spring ball, where mm. we really just find out where things stand to start with, and this is it just gives us some data to work with where things are going next more than anything sure. else. Number ten, Ole all- Miss. And they are not in the top ten of the AP. No. Mm-hmm. Number nine, Oklahoma. Interesting. So Texas is going to be ahead of Oklahoma, based on the Alabama win. That's interesting. So you're going to have a head-to-head, and this is one of these things where you know people will scream and yell that you have Oklahoma behind Texas because Texas beat Oklahoma, but mm-hmm. or Oklahoma beat Texas, but there's no way to really do it where. You know, you'll you'll get these, you know, circles where you can't you can't maintain logic, mm-hmm. you know, consistent logic on that through everything. So number eight, Alabama. So ten, Ole Miss. Nine, Oklahoma. Eight, Alabama. So it's who's left? Texas. We have Texas. Texas or probably Oregon. seven. Oregon has looked very good, better than Texas. Oregon has looked very good. I think I think I'd have Texas seven. I'd have and, Texas seven would be my yeah, especially pick. if. if Quinn Ewers is yep, hurt. There it is. Yeah, Texas is. seven. Texas back. Back to seven. Yeah, um, I'm, do we have, do we know when Quinn Ewers is coming back? How, how I far? I have not seen. I it. mean, I've heard that they're bullish about his return. It could be sooner rather than later. I mean, Malik Murphy had his moments there. I mean, we did not get to see uh, the Golden Child. You know, the other Golden Child, Arch Manning, in that game, but. Uh, there's hopes that in around Austin that they're going to get uh, Ewers back sooner rather than later, whatever that means. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I think they, they with, need with him back. The head to head, I know that you don't have to go buy it, but I think when one team is undefeated and the other is not, you do. So I'm expecting mm-hmm. Oregon, Washington here in the, the six and the five. That's probably that's probably right. And it, but it I think would be you play, really if they play interesting. Played, they played again. I'm taking Oregon. I think so too. And you got to remember that Oregon loss 
was by three points and it was a field goal that went wide by I don't know that mu- I mean that much it was it did it it was not that was not a blowout that was not any and that was in Seattle I'm pretty sure yeah right we listened to it yeah we, we listened, listened to, to it, it in the car, car. yeah I so think yeah I don't I have the memory the thing, of the I, field in my head yeah we saw a little bit of it at where where did we have dinner at like Texas Roadhouse or something like that where do we always have dinner of course it was Texas Roadhouse. Cracker Barrel. Yes, it was in Washington. <laughs> and during the two hours we were sitting inside the Texas Roadhouse in the middle of nowhere in Indiana or can, wherever that was. Can, can I yeah, just say... Yeah, were we like, in like Westfield or something? Where, where, what happened to the peanuts? Is this a COVID cutback? Like, is this a recession type of thing? There's no peanuts anywhere in that Texas Roadhouse. The allergy lobby You're not asking strong. the right question. You're not asking oh. the right question. Is was this Ohio America? State? That's the correct oh. question. I thought, was it Ohio State launched an investigation and got rid of the peanuts? Is that what we're saying? I know whose brother I have, I think, is to blame for that. Mr. Peanut. Mr. Peanut. You you read my mind. Chris Peanut. It's pretty easy. Most Most of the time you're thinking about Mr. Peanut. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Is it Mr. Peanut? You read my mind. Yes. Yes. Any any yes, any surprises so t- in there? Ole Miss, to me, um, they are in the. I mean, they're they're ten in the coaches, they're eleven in the AP. So nothing. The way that they played there, but... against Alabama, I that was an egg. That was a stinky, stinky egg with what they did against Bama. I mean, congratulations for for drilling an LSU team that I don't think a whole lot about. Um, that that Alabama game is going to stick in my mind. One one thing that I think is maybe helping their resume that you're not thinking about is they beat Tulane on the road by 17 mm-hmm. points. And I think Tulane was missing their quarterback in that game, but that is another ranked win for them just to There's Oregon kind at of six. throw that on the resume. So Oregon at six, yes. So, yeah, and then is Washington five is the interesting question because I could see them if they really – yeah, Washington there five. There you go. Yeah. So now what will they reveal – Four, of, I, I would assume right now, you're because there's still dr- um, drama. There's drama. Well, there's, well, there's not a there's not a de yeah. facto one. Normally, if there's yeah. a de facto yeah. one, they'll kind of do that and then work mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, normally, normally once you get a little closer, it's one, two, three, four because four and five are the biggest spots mm-hmm. where you know, are you in or are you out? So, what are we thinking here? I'm, Oh, Florida State. Florida State, number four. Interesting. Okay. With that win over they, LSU. They, mm-hmm. Yeah, they have a win over LSU, which is a good good win. But I don't – who else was in the rankings earlier from the, from the ACC? Was it just Louisville? Yes. They have We're not, not counting Notre yeah, Dame. They, yeah, they lost to um, – I just pulled up Clemson's schedule. Not, not. Well, part you of don't want to do that. Not, to, not a part of tonight's show. You don't want to well, be Florida. Trent from Spartanburg. Yeah, <laughs> LSU. They had a, that th- three touchdown win over LSU, and then they beat Duke thirty-eight twenty. But that's it. And then the rest of their schedule is nothing. They don't play Louisville. So there you go. Michigan three, eight zero. Oh, so. Yeah, so so we are going based on uh, we are going. This has to be Ohio State. Uh, Ohio State has to be number one. If if you're putting yeah. Michigan three, then it has to be Ohio State number one because you're doing it based on there you go. resume. So yeah, Georgia two, Ohio State going to be number one. Unless what they pull a surprise about Clemson number one? Oh, it's Ohio State. What a surprise! <laughs> Well, we decided not to rank Ohio State until we find out how they're doing with that investigation that they well, began into. Why would Ohio State do this? Why would Ohio State do this? <laughs> so. I, I'm already so excited for all of the faux outrage about how oh, everyone can see that fill in the blank team is better than Ohio State. And I mean, the thinking, on, I mean, just the thinking on this, I even without listening to them, I have the TV on mute. Let me explain the committee's thinking to you. Ohio State has two wins that are better than any other team's two best wins so far this year by a decent amount. And, yeah, the games are relatively close. Sometimes that happens when you're playing good teams. Lots of teams yeah. can beat the crappy teams by a lot of points. It's harder to beat the good teams by a lot of points. 
Thank you for coming to my oh. TED Talk. <laughs> so Ohio State's two wins are against 11 Penn State and 15 Notre Dame. Alabama has wins over uh, number 10 Ole Miss <laughs> and number 17 Tennessee. And uh, uh, Ohio State. State – yeah, here's here's the resume comparison. Ohio State first in strength of record, fifteenth in strength of schedule. Key wins: eleven Penn State at number fifteen Notre Dame. Neither Georgia nor Michigan has a ranked win. Michigan has Michigan's best win is against Rutgers, and their second best win is against Minnesota, who we were just talking about earlier as basically a speed bump for Ohio State in the next couple of weeks. Ohio so, State gets to play both of those teams coming up here this month. Mm-hmm. Yep. But the, yeah. I, and, I, and the, the strength of schedule that they had listed, I'm hitting the, the jump back. They had Georgia at, with the 100th strength of schedule and Michigan with 111. And there are 130 mm-hmm. teams recognized as Division One FBS with three teams that are transitional right now. So 111 isn't very good and 100 isn't a whole lot better. No, and that's with most of their schedule being – Big Ten, like that's how bad their conference schedule has been as well. We know that the non-conference was terrible, but the conference schedule to this point has been horrific as well, and they'll end up playing just two ranked teams. I don't, I don't expect Maryland to make it after losing to Northwestern. Uh, even if they win out, I don't think that uh, I don't think you should be ranked after losing to this Northwestern team right now. No. I do agree with Troy V. Michigan fans will tell you how great UNLV and Rutgers are. UNLV being the best statistical offense that they have faced this year, but they built those statistics up against UNLV's schedule, so you would expect them to be decent there. But they've played no kind of quarterback. Um, I think half, half of the quarterbacks they've played have been backups at this point. So this doesn't surprise me, and there's plenty of time for them to – impress everybody with with meaningful wins rather than just their the JV wins that they're getting. So um yeah I, I'm interested to see so Washington and Oregon, they will play again, I think at this point. That is what you know mm-hmm. what's gonna happen. And the winner of that one is possibly in um unless I don't think Michigan can get in with a loss to Ohio State at this point. Even if the Pac-12 champion comes out with one loss, I think a lot of people truly believe, and I'm I'm not saying that I'm far off of this either. I think that that top to the bottom of the middle, the Pac-12 is the best conference right now. I mean, I just I think so. I mean, the the, the Big Ten is two and a half teams. The SEC is three teams. The the Big 12 has completely cannibalized itself. The ACC has got Florida State at this point. Um, I mean, if you just look at the the number of Pac-12 teams here in its swan song that are in the that are in the top 25, it should show there. So I think that there's going to be some weight that will be carried there. I think the Big 12 has largely played itself out, um, and I think that uh, Florida State better be careful. Well, Florida State's schedule is pretty easy, but that's another reason they can't afford to lose. Coming up, they have um, they just played. They've got they're at. Pitt, then they're against my, then they have Miami at home, and then um, some logo I don't even know what it is, and then uh, at Florida. So, um, is it the Kiwanis Club? No, it's uh, North UNA. North I don't know. Alabama. Is that Northern Arizona? North Alabama. North Alabama. North North Alabama. Alabama. No, yes. uh, yeah. North NAU is Northern Arizona. Uh, yes. Yeah, NAU. We were actually hanging out with somebody. Mm before the Wisconsin game that had some ties to Northern Arizona. And we were hearing all of the exploits of the fighting. I don't, I don't know what a lumberjacks. 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 Come on. Come on. It's it's not, it's, it's not SFA. It's not Stephen F. Austin who are the lumberjacks. So at this point, Florida state is essentially in to the ACC championship game. And they will be playing either Louisville or Virginia tech. And the thing is, Louisville and Virginia Tech both have one loss in the ACC. They play this weekend. So that will perhaps set up the ACC championship game. And I'm telling you that right now, I don't care to watch Florida State against Virginia Tech. I don't know. Maybe you guys, maybe you guys are sickos, but I do not want to see Virginia Tech I mean, anywhere near any kind of conference. Wives. 
Mm, I, mm, uh, it's better mm. than Sister Wives. I would much rather watch that. But at Adam Boxu, uh, I'm worried this can be rat poison. Thoughts? I, I mean, I think Ohio State has spent lots of time hearing about all the stuff that's wrong with it. So this is not. You know, th this is not an Ohio State team that has been dominant from week to week, that has just annihilated people, that is just on absolute cruise control. I mean, we, we just sat through a Ryan Day press conference today where, you know, it was like, well, some stuff is better, but, you know, boy, a lot of guys are hurt. And, uh, you know, what's what's wrong with the, the quarterbacks? And, you know, boy, the offense is sure not up to its normal standard. Like, I, I don't I don't think I'm real worried about rat poison with Ohio State. I think this is probably going to be, you know, any if you're anywhere below number one, right now Kirby Smart is uh, giving them the, you, they don't respect you. They don't think you're, they don't even remember that you've won the national championship two years in a row. They don't think you can drive your car fast. They, can you believe the disrespect from the college football playoff committee? And Michigan is saying, Take it from Connor. It, this is a team that you know you've been killing people, and no one respects you. And they, they, this is all made up, and it's all someone else's fault. And and you know, Florida State is you know had a big win over LSU earlier, and they're fourth. And so you know, they, they don't think your resume is as good as the team with the good resume. They don't think your results are as good as the teams with the game control results. So. You know, everyone everyone can – and then Washington is undefeated and has a good win over Oregon and is not even in the field. So they can gripe and complain too. So it, this is much more – Ohio State just doesn't get to be, uh, you know, grievance people for a while. That's about the only thing that I think comes out of being number one week one. Well, And now they'll have the schedule to where they should be able to stay there. And if they don't play well enough to stay there, then it's really hard to say, oh, they – you know – you kind of lose some of the argument, not that it matters whether you're one or whatever, just be in the top four and you'll be happy with that, but they should be able to maintain that um, looking good to help to their, to the eye test to go along with their schedule. Other schedules will start to catch up though. Georgia, like I said earlier, their schedule will start to catch up with Ohio States, Michigan's will as well. So if you want to stay number one, you got to start looking like it. They, you can earn your way, way to the number one, but to stay there, you got to be pretty. And Ohio State hasn't been very pretty of late. Uh, but I don't know. I was going to say, when you go to New Jersey, does that make you prettier? I mean, I get, maybe it depends where. Maybe. As long as you're standing next to Snooky. There you go. There you go. So Boo Corrigan's going to jump up on ESPN in like a minute. When he's done with that i'm gonna jump off and jump on a t to the teleconference to hear what he has to say to everybody else and maybe get a question and i don't at this point i don't have really, really any questions about ohio state um because they're number one it's like why isn't ohio state number one well sir they are so what what other questions do you have about this and why aren't they super number one <laughs> what took you so long to announce them as number one sir why do the people in our chat not think they're number one well, according to Billy Tuesday, nobody in the ESPN panel actually thinks we're the best team. So, I mean, I guess, assuming that that is Ohio State, and I certainly have had debates with people on social media, and I said, look, I don't, I'm not arguing one way or the other, but even as the title of the show, resume versus results, and I think a lot of people out there are going to play the results card. And Ohio State certainly, I mean, there's no denying Ohio State's averaging, allowing 10 points per game on defense against uh Schedule that rank, but number 11 and strength of schedule nationally. Uh, yeah, Ohio State is down 10 plus points per game of what it was scoring last year, but Ohio State couldn't get across the finish line. Yeah, I'm this is something I don't think there's any going to be any rat poison there, uh, as was asked earlier. Um, <laughs> did everyone cross the sneaky reference off of your bingo cards? That was actually the free space because we know how much Kevin loves Jersey Shore. Super chat. It just you feel closer to Tom. <laughs> Super, chat. Professor Professor Chaos. Chaos. Super chat. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. I hate this notion that offensive play is all that matters for how you quote unquote look when defense does actually matter. And yeah, I mean, for Ohio State fans who are saying, 
you know, the defense is fine, but what about the offense? Uh, I will invite you to go back and watch the 2021 and 2022 and arguably even 2020 Ohio State football teams and tell me how's that working out for you. I'm just looking at the matchup as they have it up there as it would be right now. And we look at the rankings, but I hadn't even Ohio, really thought about the matchups. Ohio State, Florida State. Do you play that in New Orleans or do you play that out the Rose Bowl? Rose Bowl. Think about this. You have a, you have an opportunity to, number one, play in the Rose Bowl. Number two, make Florida State go all the way across the field. And number three, make Michigan play Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. Now, obviously, this is not <laughs> how these rankings are actually going to sort themselves out. But mm-hmm. you get a chance to do the thing that you enjoy and where most of you know a lot of your players have been already. And you get to stick Michigan playing Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. Like, I don't know how fast uh, Ryan Day would say yes to that, but uh, I'm guessing it is very fast. But how fast would the Ohio State beat, say, to get to spend New Year's on uh, Bourbon Street or, mm. or close to Bur- – I, I don't even know when the damn game is. I, it's probably on the 31st <laughs> because it's just how things seem to work. Uh, yeah. That's a good question. No, no, it's I mean, it's New Year's Day. It's on New Year's is Day it, this year. Is it New it's Year's always, Day? It's always – yeah, it, when, it, when it's in the Rose Bowl and Sugar Bowl, it's on New Year's Day. Okay. So. Well, good. Then, yeah, I – Selfishly would like to go to New Orleans, but I do agree 100% as much as it pains me to say with your reasoning there. There's nothing like the Rose Bowl. No, there is nothing like the Rose Bowl. Kevin is outvoted again because Kevin is wrong again. It's fine. (laughs) I, I, I've been to New Orleans. Everything nice I've said about you. (laughs) The one time I was in New Orleans. Both things. Yeah. I don't, I don't. New Orleans is not my scene. It's too crowded, and I would th- I thought it was too crowded when it was COVID and there was nobody there. <laughs> I mean, Tony's just a complicated loner. That's just really how it is. So I'm a I'm a I'm a lone wolf. I'm a rogue staffer. Some would say. Um, I mean, you just rather hang out, to... hang out in Ypsilanti. I was just going to say, um, put my CMU pleasant, gear yes, on, or yeah. So now they're asking Has who Moose about said anything Michigan. Interesting? They're talking to him right now. I'm just reading this. What is the committee's position on the sign stealing stuff on the aspect of it as it pertains to evaluating Michigan's place in the college football playoff? Uh, their job as they look at it is to rank the teams, to follow their protocols, and they went through that. That really wasn't part of any of the discussions that they had. So... That's that's their thought on it now. And that's kind of putting your head in the sand a little bit. But as we said, like this is an ongoing thing that they may may want to continue to put their head in the sand about it or, or hand wave it. But um, I, don't, I don't know that they're going to be able to do this every single week as more comes out uh, and more damning things come out. If it does, I think the committee. I think the committee is absolutely just going to keep putting their head in the sand. That's kind of what I expected to hear from them. I wanted to kind of hear it, but I think the committee is going to look at the NCAA and say, "Well, what do you want to do?" And the NCAA is going to say, "Well, we have to give a notice of allegations, and then we have to wait ninety days, and then we have to." So you know, if something is going to happen in the short to medium term, like impacting this season, it would pretty much have to come out of the big 10. That's not really a surprise to me. And, you know, I mean, so far nothing has happened and we'll, you know, we'll see what comes out tomorrow. Cause Lord knows something interesting is coming out just about every day at this point. Well, it's part of I'm the charter saying... to pick the four most deserving teams. And I mean, isn't there a question of what deserving is at that point? I'm just playing devil's advocate here. I've already, I've already made friends in all sorts of other teams with with Notre Dame and everything else, and I'm certainly on a lot of hit lists up in in Michigan now at this point. But what is what is the definition of deserving? Before we get well, to the super chat, well, and the thing is, I'm not saying they should do something to Michigan or about Michigan, but they should talk about it. And they're not at this point. And to to not talk about it, then I mean that's it's happening. It's a real thing. And they're just not going to discuss it at this point. I think you have to eventually discuss it when you're talking about deserving. Now you don't necessarily need to, because it doesn't matter this week, but at some point you kind of have to just in terms of how do we feel about this? We don't care. Okay. Then at least we've talked about it. 
I do think a conversation needs to happen just to so they know. But um, also, if nobody brings it up, that also tells you how they feel about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just it, that just doesn't feel to me like the committee is going to just decide all willy nilly that they're going to do it. Because here's what happens: if you just go against, you know, you, if there's a perception that you are just sort of making it up as you go along. Uh, that's how you get to pay lawyers a bunch of money because that's how you get, you know, emergency injunctions and whatever else. And I have no idea the legal status, you know, the legal likelihood of that being a winning strategy for one side or the other, but it just, it gets messy pretty quickly. And I don't think they want messy. I, I would not be at all surprised if there were a lot of people in that committee room hoping against hope that Michigan dumps a game against Penn State or Ohio State. I think that's a real possibility, and then someone else solves the problem for them. But I, I just I, – I don't think there's a real likelihood that almost – I mean, the NCAA functionally can't do anything about it right now in the short to medium term. And the college football playoff committee has just never seemed like they were real likely. If Michigan goes 13-0 and Big Ten champions, I just – I don't see them getting left out unless the Big Ten has done – whatever the Big Ten might do, which again, as, as we have said a thousand times, this is all completely, completely speculative because we don't know what is going to end up coming out. We don't know it's going to be you know provable factually, and we don't know there is no precedent for this necessarily in terms of what an, uh, expected, what, what are the sentencing guidelines for this? None of that exists. So you, you're getting into the land of the extremely speculative very quickly. Super chat. Super chat, Mike Smith. Don't they typically use strength of schedule for the first rankings? It seems with so much left to play, it's the simplest formula for the first one. I think this one broke down pretty easily in terms of strength of schedule. So it was it, it was a simple thing to do because you have Georgia and Michigan who have played nobody and who have no strength of schedule, but they still like them better than Florida State. So I think it was – I'm guessing it was a pretty simple, easy – thing and, and a justifiable thing in terms of Ohio State's resume versus everybody else's. And so I, I'm guessing this wasn't a very contentious first rankings, or and I don't know that first rankings should ever be contentious. It, it's like, well, let's just get it laid down there. Um, and each week you'll have more information than before, and that's kind of where things maybe get a little more contentious as the strength of schedule start to meet up with each other. Well, and one thing that's kind of interesting about where the teams are right now, they they will I, I get the sense that Florida State's hold on the uh, the spot with um, you know the spot in the top four. If Washington keeps winning, Washington is going to be playing a much better uh, schedule down mm -hmm. the stretch than Florida State is. So you know, let's just say that the top five teams all keep winning for the next three weeks, because Ohio State plays Michigan in three, what, four weeks. So if the, the next, if all the top teams win their next three games, I would bet that Florida State's schedule of at Pitt, Miami, North Alabama uh, over the next three weeks gets them passed by by Washington, who Washington over the next three weeks are already just one spot behind uh, Florida State. They will play at USC, home for Utah, and at Oregon State before closing in the Apple Cup. So, you know, USC is going to fall out of the rankings after uh, Washington annihilates them this year. But that's still a better win than anything that that uh, um, that uh, Florida State would have. And then Utah, they get Utah at home, and they go to Oregon State. If Washington holds serve, and they have not looked great the last couple of weeks, but if Washington mm -hmm. holds serve. Washington is absolutely jumping Florida State almost no matter what Florida State does the next three weeks. And if yeah, Washington fans. Comes up, Oregon, Oregon's going to kick the door down and, and just pass them right by because Oregon is mm -hmm. is like in Death Star mode right now. Yeah, yeah and they Oregon also – real. Yeah. They'll also throw up a 1,000 points against USC. Um, but they finish at Arizona State and then Oregon State at home. Uh, I – if Washington State continues to win out, I don't expect that just based on what we've seen from them of late. But I, I don't see Florida State losing. And if Washington State or if Washington wins out, like I don't see necessarily Georgia losing. So then the 
in that scenario, the loser of Ohio State Michigan is out because you're talking. I, I don't. I don't think there's any way in the world we see four undefeated teams because we never do. But you know, there's there's a chance it happens this year, but we'll we'll see how it doesn't, and uh, go from there. I guess. Look at Tony, just not even talking about Liberty or JMU. Yeah, I'm not gonna. But uh, actually, right now, I will. I'm gonna go ahead and jump off, and then uh, leave this to you, and I'll come back and tell you what Boo had to say. All right, wave at me when you're ready to come back. Gotcha. God, thank God we got rid of him. All right. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of four unbeaten teams going into the playoff because that that's sort of the uh, you know four unbeaten power conference teams, and then you know, hey, maybe. Air Force gets there, or hey, maybe Liberty does, or whatever. That's always every single year. We're at this point of the schedule, and people go, I don't know, man, this might be the year. I don't know. And then, spoiler alert, it never actually happens because, first of all, conferences like the Pac 12 have, it feels like kind of backloaded their schedules a little bit, where, um, you know, we just went through Washington and Oregon schedules, and they both have losable games coming up. And th- that is a pretty deep conference. Um, you know, Oregon has Oregon State at home and uh, USC at home and Cal at home and then go to uh, Arizona State. But then they've got to play Washington in the Pac-12 championship game. Washington has uh, er- has uh, at USC, Utah, at Oregon State, Washington State, and then Oregon in the Big 12 championship game. I would be pretty surprised if Washington made it through unbeaten. So I think already that's that's going to fall apart. Florida State just doesn't play anyone, and it would take, you know, I mean, there, there are always the jokes about Pitt just coming out of nowhere and just crushing people's hopes and dreams. They already did it to, uh, what, Louisville this year. So, you know, it, that's a, it's it a can happen. It's a bad Pitt team. It is a bad Pitt yeah. team. But who, yeah, I mean, now that the AC. 7 in Notre Dame. Now that the ACC has gone away from the coastal and the Atlantic and the whatever, I mean, their divisions, who is, I mean, who is the biggest challenge for them to face in the ACC title game? I mean, it is just such a meh league in terms of what's there. I mean, obviously it's not going to be Clemson. I mean, it's not going to be Miami. I mean, North Carolina can't get out of its own way. I mean, are we going to get stuck with like, you know, Florida State, UNC or something? I mean, I I think that for those that are looking for chaos, I would feel best about them going against a team that has an offensive pulse. I mean, you've got Drake May, NC2A finally figured out the Tez Walker situation. They've got some receivers. Eh, Then defense isn't all that great, but... uh, you know, I, I, I would rather see that than I, I don't even know. I mean, I look at the ACC and just the glut of teams up there very much like the way that I look at the Big Ten West right now with nobody wanting to win that division. Yeah, I think right now my money for who plays Florida State in the ACC championship game would be on Louisville. They have only that one loss at Pitt. Their remaining schedule, they play Virginia Tech this weekend. Boy, the Virginia Tech-Louisville game might be like a play-in game for the ACC title game. That is not great. Uh, that game is in Louisville. I think Louisville is a better team anyway, so I, I would guess that they win that. After that, they've got Virginia at home, at Miami, and then Kentucky at home. So, you know, they just need to win the next three. If they win the next three, they're going to be the team playing Florida State in the ACC title game. The question, I mean, I could easily see them winning the next three, somehow losing to Kentucky in the Commonwealth Cup and ending up, uh, you know, like a not a very quality win for Florida State. Florida State better – Florida State does not have any real losable games left on the schedule. They better not trip up because you could see a scenario where a 12 – and or an 11, uh, what, 11-1 and one non-Big Ten champion – uh, or even a, a you know twelve and one non Pac twelve champion Washington something like that might get in over a uh, twelve and one ACC champion Florida State or a twelve and one non ACC champion Florida State. They're just the resume is not really there right now, and the resume is just not going to get better while everyone else's does get better. So 
that I think is something, you know, I, I think that would be something I'd be a little concerned about if I was a Florida state fan right now. Yeah. I don't, I don't like a one loss Florida state team up against a lot of the other teams in the discussion right now. And I can already hear Danny Cannell's head exploding over that, but it's just the reality. I don't really think that it's, Apples to apples. I mean, we talk so much about what schedules are, and the ACC does not generate the best schedules by any stretch of the imagination. And congratulations on your big win against LSU at the beginning of the season. But if you trip one up now at this point when your feet are to the fire, it's not more so than losing games. It's when you lose games. And you can't be losing games in November. Not not when the margins are this thin. The other thing that kind of raises a question when it comes to Florida State being a one-loss team, I didn't, we didn't even – the SEC, Kevin, I guess technically we need to talk about the SEC with regard to the playoff. I think you, there's a way you could see two Big Ten teams getting in. I think there's a way you could see two SEC teams getting in, depending on what what else happens. If you know, if you have the the Pac-12 teams both dump another game and and you end up with a two-loss Pac-12 champion, if you have you know Florida State looks real uninspiring and loses a game, if you know Texas or Oklahoma dumps another one, like you could you could see one of the uh, Big Ten or SEC getting two teams in. For the SEC, I think it's probably a matter of Alabama wins out and wins a close SEC championship game over Georgia. And you could you, you could see Alabama to Georgia four in that scenario or something like that, so you don't have a rematch. Which which conference is more likely to get two in this year, do you think? Is it is it the Big Ten because they have one and three right now, or is it the SEC because when you go through Alabama's schedule, they don't have that much left. And when you go through Georgia's schedule, you know, there's there's nothing that's you know, just mind-blowingly difficult. Where it's just, oh boy, this grueling, grueling schedule. They've got, they got all, uh, all Mississippi and Ole Miss and Tennessee left, but those are all winnable games. If they win those three, that resume looks a lot stronger. And then I think you could see them getting in, even at a twelve and one non-SEC championship. I mean, short of Alabama winning out, I do. Alabama's not a top four team to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're just not. Um, I understand that Alabama has taken care of the business in front of them, but I also would say that if Lane Kiffin would have actually had his team practice, that game could have been a lot closer. Jalen Milrow, you know, you can talk about all the issues that you have, you know, you as people in general with Kyle McCord leading the offense. I mean, we're seeing more out of Jalen Milrow at quarterback, but he's, I, I don't I don't see it. I, this is not one of Nick Saban's better teams. This team does not seem to have a championship look to it. So if I mean yes, if Alabama wins out, wins the SEC championship, and Georgia, the only game it drops is a close championship game there, it's going to be hard to pull them out of there. But you look at Ohio State and you look at Michigan, and we're going we're going to remove the allegations of sign stealing and everything else that's out there. We're just going to talk this on a football level. Michigan's allowing the fewest points in the nation. Ohio state's allowing like the second fewest points in the nation, whatever it is. Um, These are two teams that have played very well. And the assumption would be there that we're looking at, you know, the only loss that the loser of this battle would have would be to the other team. So I would really have a hard time if, if the opportunity was there to get two teams in, I would say the Big Ten, but I also know part of it is my bias against Bama, this Bama team, and part of it is I'm too close to the I'm too close to the trees right now of the Big Ten to kind of get away from that. And some of that might also hinge on what does Penn State do from here on out? What does Notre Dame do from here on out? If Notre Dame wins out, then Notre Dame finishes ten and two, and that's a pretty darn good road win that's going to stack up with just about anyone's road wins uh, in the country. They all they have left on their schedule, they have uh, they're at Clemson this weekend. Then they have a week off. Then they've got Wake Forest. Then they're at Stanford. So they've already done the heavy lifting. They just need to not find a banana peel, and they'll be ten and two and probably a 
top eight ish team. I mean, you're, you're going to move up a little bit because so many of the teams ahead of you are going to get, are going to knock each other off. So that has a, uh, an opportunity to be a top 10 road win for Ohio state. And you know, the Alabama thing we get, the Alabama conversation could be functionally over this weekend. We are, you know, just, just in case you're curious about how, uh, wondering how curious we are about the Alabama LSU game this weekend. Uh, we are making our travel plans on our way home from Rutgers around being able to watch that game. So with with yeah, beers, that, that, that's a real big game. That is a real big game. You know, if, I'm if very excited State about fan, it. Yeah, if you were an Ohio State fan, boy, that is that's a game that could really change things because Alabama already has that one loss to Texas. So if they have a second loss. I don't think I don't has there ever been a two loss team in the playoff? I don't think there has. And uh LSU already has two losses as well. So, you know, then then you're you're functionally basically eliminating the SEC West for the most part out, you know, other than Ole Miss, I guess, but Ole Miss has to play Georgia. So that would give Ole Miss a second loss. So then if Alabama loses to LSU and Ole Miss loses to Georgia. Then the whole SEC West has two losses, so you've basically eliminated eliminated the SEC West from the playoff conversation. And if Ole Miss doesn't beat, or if Ole Miss does beat Georgia, well, then we're having a whole separate conversation about Georgia, and you know that then they're not a uh, then they're not a uh, an undefeated team going into that uh, SEC championship game, and they need to win it or they're out. So this weekend, you know, it feels like every week when you get this close to the end of the season, every week. There are games that are like, oh man, this is going to be a monster one for the college football playoff. The Alabama LSU game that could be that could, we could be having a whole different conversation next Tuesday if right. if uh, LSU pulls that one off. Well, until you set up the pieces on the board, and yes, we've had nine weeks of the regular season. You know, Ohio State's had eight games and it's open week or whatever. We've had nine weeks to kind of get to this point, but until you put the chess pieces on the board. You can't really look at how things move because you kind of have to get in the heads of the committee and everything else. I want to get here to Ryan Day's Beard's Mm -hmm. comment here about Penn State needing to beat Michigan. Now, the Penn State team that we saw against Indiana was not very good. But, you know, heart of a champion or whatever you want to have or Indiana pulling a full Hoosier. uh, Heart of a Hoosier. Yeah, love each other. Uh, (laughs) Penn State prevailed. Now. What is – obviously, if, if Penn State beats Michigan, then you're sitting there and you're looking at a situation of where you you theoretically bring in the three-way – you know, you could bring in the three-way tie again, though. So, I mean, in some ways, I don't, I don't know – you know, we need the Tony Gerdeman tip sheet or whatever in terms of who to root for in terms of that whole situation. I know Ohio State fans would love to see Michigan lose every game, but I also think Ohio State fans would love to be the one to end their little two-year run of whatever, cheating or no cheating. Well, and so in this scenario, let's just play this out for a minute. And then I do want to get to you. I know I see you have a number of questions saved, so we can get to those in a minute. But just to just sort of play this out real quickly, if Penn State beats Michigan, and I am not expecting that to happen, but if Penn State does beat Michigan, then either, number one, Ohio State beats Michigan and they're undefeated and they go to the Big Ten Championship game and they play whoever comes out of that disaster of a Western division and they presumably win and then they're a 13-0 and Big Ten champion. Or Michigan beats Ohio State and you have a three-way tie with Ohio State, Michigan, and Penn State all having one loss in conference. So this is, again, assuming that Penn State beats Michigan, Michigan beats Ohio State. At that point, you go through a bunch of tiebreakers that you can't settle, and you get down to, I believe it's a fifth tiebreaker, which is the record, the conference record of the teams from the opposing division that you played. And right now, the, the, the whole Western division is a complete mess, and I'm, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but you know the three and two teams out there are Iowa, who, Mich- who Penn State played, Nebraska, who Michigan played, Minnesota, who Ohio State and Michigan both played, Wisconsin, who Ohio State played, uh, and then Northwestern is two and three. Penn State played them. Illinois, one and four. I think Michigan played them, I think. No, Penn State played them. I don't remember. Uh, And then Purdue, who Ohio State played, is one and four as well. So 
you know, if, if you end up in a uh, three-way tie with all three of those teams being at seven and one in conference, it could come down to like the Iowa Nebraska game on black Friday or, you know, the uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Paul Bunyan ax game on uh, I think that's a Saturday game. I don't think that's a Friday game that weekend, but it could come down to the stupid Abe Lincoln hat game between Northwestern and Illinois. I mean, th- this is, it's crazy that you could have, you know, Northwestern and Illinois, Illinois potentially deciding which team comes out of the Big Ten East and therefore which team goes into uh, the Big Ten Championship and therefore which team has the chance to get the special one-year conference bonus and go to the uh, college football playoff. But, you know, that's that's why we're, as we are here on the last day of October, my advice to everyone would be handle your business and don't put it in the hands of Northwestern and Illinois. Well, that and also if you sit there and you have a three-way tie at the top of the league, and Ohio State loses its last game, doesn't go to the Big Ten championship game, could Ohio State be relegated to being, quote-unquote, the third-best team in the Big Ten because of that? And could that push things? I mean, if, if, if that belief becomes reality in the eyes of a committee or whatever, I mean, then you're, I mean, you're, you're beyond drawing dead at that point. So mm-hmm. I'm not here to tell people who to root for or anything like that. I mean, I think as people have already said in the chat, Ohio State beating Michigan is of paramount importance for Ohio State. But if you're worried about things getting a little hinky in that game or whatever, I would say uh, you probably don't want Penn State to be gumming up the works. It's just, you know, my my 50 second thought on this without, you know, without giving it a ton of thought. All right. Do we want to get to a couple of these questions yeah, before Johnny pops me, back on? Let me let me clear out. Here's here's a, a game question here from Brian DeGroff. Do you all believe Emeka plays this weekend or will they give him another week off? I, you know, Ryan Day said on Tuesday that Emeka could have played against Wisconsin, but they decided to kind of they didn't, you know, functionally, I think they didn't need to play him. So they wanted to give him another week off. Uh, at this point, I'm going to believe it when I see it in terms of him being out there because they're gonna. They were gonna see if he could practice this weekend, or he was gonna. They were planning to have him practice this week, but you know, this is this is one of these things where you you obviously need him healthy for Michigan, and do you need him healthy for Rutgers? Maybe, maybe not. I think he makes the trip. I think he probably could play. I would have my money on they play it safe one more week, and then you have him. You know, then he just plays two weeks at home to get ready for the Michigan game and there's no sense in rushing him back. What's the stat, you know, is Julian Fleming a hundred percent that might play into that decision a little bit, you know, but I, I think you're probably, I think he could play. I don't know that I'm expecting him to play. I'm looking at the opponent in terms of Rutgers and Rutgers can play some defense. Granted, it's only played one offense in my opinion. That was Michigan. Uh, I think Rutgers is a little offensively challenged. I mean, I think we could say that a little bit about Ohio State in some regards, but you're looking at a at a Rutgers team. Gavin Wimsat is a 50.2% passer this year. They are a run, run, run team. They've got a pretty good running back. Wimsat can run the ball. He's probably the most dual threat quarterback they're going to face, at least up until McCarthy. Um, people say, well, what about Tungvaloa? He is a mobile quarterback. Uh, Wimsat is a running quarterback. He is much more of a runner than a thrower. Um, but I don't see a Rutgers team that's going to put up a lot of points. We saw a lesson learned last year with rushing JSN back, probably by JSN wanting to rush back. And you didn't have him the rest of the way. I think that every week that you let Jack or that you let uh, Emeka get better is going to be worth its weight in gold with whatever type of postseason you're hoping to have. So um, I do think that there is the necessity to ease him back in, to get him some run before you throw him in there against Michigan. I wouldn't necessarily even be opposed to just get him out there in terms of just, look, you're going to field the punch. You are going to call fair catch every single time. And you're just, you're going, you're going to knock the rust off 
and we're going to do that. And then against Sparty, you know, we'll 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 play you like the first quarter or something like that. And then then you maybe you take the training wheels off for Minnesota, and then it's full go against Michigan. Yeah, and I'm seeing a lot of questions about quarterback health in the chat. Kyle McCord left uh, the stadium in Madison with a bunch of ice on his left foot, maybe a walking boot of some kind. I couldn't really tell, but yeah, yeah. he, yeah, he, he was, and you could tell he was limping around on the field. He got hit on a scramble at one point. So he's not a hundred percent. Devin Brown still working his way back from the injury. Ryan Day said he was potent, you know, they were hoping to have him practice a little bit this week, but you can kind of see that might be one where again, if you can get through with, uh, I, I would expect Devin Brown to make the trip this weekend. If he practices, I think you have him make the trip because I think you would rather have Devin Brown at 80% than Tristan Jebbia, who we have still not seen on the field this year for Ohio State. He, he would be QB2 if Devin Brown's not able to go. And then you're, you know, you're one play away from having Dev, Tristan Jebbia make his first snaps as a on a road game in November which is probably not ideal. You're going to travel so, four quarterbacks. You're going to travel. You're yeah. going to travel the three of them and Lincoln Keenholz. I mean, yes, there are limitations mm-hmm. as to how many players you can bring on the road, but you know what? If you don't bring, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to name a player specifically because that's not fair to them. But if you don't bring an additional, I, I don't know, an additional safety or something like that, somebody who hasn't seen even like the, the top end of the threes right now, you're not going to hurt yourself. In my opinion, you, you need to make sure that you have everything right at quarterback. Well, uh, and I don't, be- I don't believe I saw Devin Brown in Madison last weekend. I could be wrong on that. I know that Chad Ray, who is uh, from, he's one of the walk-on quarterbacks. I think he might've been the fourth quarterback they had, but you do, you, like you said, you bring four quarterbacks just in case. Um, you know, that, that would have, you know, to get, to get to your fourth quarterback, a lot of stuff has to go wrong, but it is possible. Troy V, how long after one of the teams lose in the top five before the calls for JMU and Air Force start being heard in mass? Um, here's the thing. You've got, you've got three group of five teams that are undefeated right now. JMU, Liberty, and Air Force Academy. They're all vying for one spot to be in the, the access bowls of New Year's Six to take on a very unmotivated team who knows they have nothing to win, nothing to gain in this game. But no, you're not going to have a point to where I think one of those teams are coming out. This isn't Cincinnati coming out of the American or anything like that. And that's no, you know, no, disre- no uh, disrespect to any of these teams. But, you know, yeah, you're going to have some of your agent provocateurs who are going to come out and say some things about, oh, you know, this is the last year of the four team. Just do it. Come on. Come on. And, but we're no, no, no. That's my two Well, sons. and w- one thing that's worth mentioning here is that James Madison is not eligible for the postseason this year. Yeah, now, that's what I forgot. Yeah. That's incre- it's incredibly stupid, but they are because they are transitioning up from FCS to SB- FBS, you, you cannot participate in the postseason your first two years. Yes, the NCAA should absolutely grant them a waiver, of course. And you know, if they if they end up being undefeated, and you know should be the group of five representative, absolutely they should get a waiver and should get to go play in the whatever Peach Bowl against Ole Miss or whatever it is. There's there's no reason. It's it's one of the dumbest rules. The thinking behind it is that if you uh, allow teams to uh, play in a bowl game your first year, teams will make that decision on when to move up based on, well, we're going to be good this year, so we're going to move up this year and try and you know immediately win the, win the conference and immediately uh, get to the whatever. This is the second year that James Madison has been in FBS. The remaining schedule at Georgia State, UConn, App State, and at Coastal. So Coastal's five and three. App State is not what you think of App State as this year. Uh, UConn has been dreadful. Georgia State this weekend might be their their best chance to take a loss, and they are coming off of a loss against their rivals from Georgia Southern. Yeah, a twelve and zero James Madison absolutely deserves to play for the Sun Belt Championship, and absolutely deserves a chance to be in the New Year Six. It's ridiculous that that's a, that rule is still in place, and it, it's you know you put the rule in place to 
keep people from making an impulsive jump that is, you know, you're, you're going to risk it all for the chance to do this. Well, okay. They made the jump. It's gone fine. They're not doing anything they're not supposed to do. It's fine. Why are you punishing the players? Like this is, this is nominally supposed to be about the players and the student athletes, Kevin. So the important thing is let's make sure our paperwork is all in order and we punish the children just because. Well, again, we have to have adults in the room that are getting paid a lot of money to make decisions to harm the kids. So I don't know. I do not want to hear from my one buddy at the NC2A, so I will just limit it there. But to his credit, I don't really catch a lot of grief from him. Not even sure if he watches. And if he is, hello. Uh, Thomas Kirkpatrick, gut sense. Big Ten will stand up and put Michigan in its place. Facts will trump narrative. That is how decisions are made by leadership. Well, what's interesting, we talked about all the all the stuff that we don't know right now. You know, what what does the Big Ten have? What does the Big Ten have a hold of in terms of information? What does the Big Ten have a hold of in terms of fact? I know we have heard additional stuff that has not come out yet, at, you know, sort of in the in the in the wind, in the rumor mill. Then the question is, okay, how much of that comes out? How much of that can you prove? And then when does that come out? And then there is, again, no stipulated punishment. There's no you know, sentencing guidelines here for this kind of punishment. The NCAA can't do it. So it's up to the Big Ten. And you're asking, you know, what does what is Tony Petiti going to do? And Tony Petiti just took over as commissioner. So we don't have this track record of what Tony Petiti is going to do. We don't know. And, I, you know, I, I think there is... It is possible that enough stuff comes out that is damning enough and, you know, provable enough that maybe something happens, because I think you're going to have a drumbeat from the other 13 schools in the Big Ten that, you know, something needs to happen. And, you know, if, you, if your vote is 13 to one, you're probably going to side with the 13. But even if there is, what is that? What What is that? what is that vote? You know, what, what is the decision? Even if there is something and Michigan goes 12 and 0 in the regular season and the big 10 says, you're not eligible for the big 10 championship game. Just hypothetically, I have no idea if that's even on the table, but hypothetically, even if they say that, does that keep Michigan out of the college football playoff? No, not necessarily. So I, I don't know what to expect because there's just, there's so many variables. Let's let it continue to play out in terms of what comes out, what has you know what comes out that's provable what you know when does that come out what does the big 10 want to do about it there's just a lot of uh there's a lot of stuff um that's still to play oh boy south bend i know Reporter. i brought this up because i wanted us to have a chance to talk about it before tony gets back and has a chance to talk about it south bend Re- tribune reporter asks about notre dame's controversial loss to ohio state what was controversial about it? Um, I don't know that the Notre Dame's coaches can't count. Is that controversial? You're supposed to have a college degree to be a coach, and you should probably have simple counting down? I don't know. Is it – that's something. We've we've heard some doozies through the years on teleconferences, but that's pretty – yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know what would be controversial about that. I mean, it was a close loss, certainly. It was a competitive loss. There's lots of C words you could apply to that. Controversial, I don't think you really could. There was, were there any calls in that game that were like big calls that went against Notre Dame that I'm not remembering? I don't, I mean, so so much of that game. I mean, maybe it, maybe Igman Osten had a PI in there. So I don't know. I mean, nothing that was nothing that right, was out, that's not. outside of the range of what is a normal football game. Yeah, I mean, the, the usual. Oh, you should have called pass interference here. You should have called holding there. I mean, every team has those every single game. I mean, there was something you I don't remember when we were walking out that the stadium PA guy kind of had a little bit of a little bit of flavor with the way he said some things. And there was something in there that you said that he was a little, you know, mm-hmm. had a little edge to him on it or what, that, but I don't remember what it was. I mean, week it, three it was, it was, was a hundred weeks yeah. ago. It was the Davis and Igbenosin, uh where it was like, yeah, you could have called pass interference on that. And uh, the PA guy goes, Davis and Igbenosin on the, 
coverage. It was it was really well delivered, but yeah, I mean it, that that was not a play that was that was not the last play of the game where uh, who was it? Someone just got screwed on a uh, oh it was USC and Cal. Uh, USC uh, was uh, probably a little physical with Cal's uh, receivers on the two point conversion play at the end of that game. It, that that was not that that was that game came down to one play from the one yard line and Notre Dame did not have 11 guys on the field. So that's not controversial. That's oops. Super chat from CBJ one, CBJ Buckeye one, 2018 Indiana run ran crossing routes all day on Michigan the week before the Ohio state game with Penn state having a good D and Michigan decent on offense. Can they give OSU insight in the weeks leading up to the game? Well, how much insight do you need to know? If you don't know what Michigan is by now, then, then, then there's some larger problems. I think, I mean, Ohio state doesn't need to go out and, and, and read all the signs to know what, you know, what it is that Michigan is going to attempt to do and so on and so forth. I mean, you certainly go to school on what you see other teams having success with, but it's one of those things that if the, the little Dutch boy, plugs a hole in the dam or whatever. Okay. Th- we, we got, we got burnt by X. They're going to focus on trying to protect X and then you have to find what Y is going to be. But I mean, I think that, you know, I think there's always the chance of kind of looking and seeing there. I mean, one of the things that we're not talking about in terms of just on the field is Michigan's schedule is just so backloaded in terms of what, you know, it's only real opponents are all coming in, Back to back to back fashion, and I'm not including Purdue. Uh, you know, the last three weeks of the regular season, the you know the volume knob goes from mute to actual legitimate whole numbers. So uh, there there will be things to, to to gain and to gather from it. Yeah, and then it goes to 11 the last week of the season. That's going to be that's going to be crazy. And yeah, I mean, I guess. You're going to learn more about Michigan over the next month than you have prior to now. Part of that has to do with the competition. Part of that has to do with the gestures vaguely towards sideline. Uh, you know, how, how does the loss of your sign guy, how does that impact things? How does the distraction around the program impact things? And then how does having to play better, a better competition this month impact things? All of those things are potentially interesting because, you know, this is, we're talking about 18 to 22 year old guys. And these are people who are not necessarily always laser focused on absolutely everything. And Michigan has been able to kind of skate through the first couple months of the season. And they've looked very good at times and they've looked not that great at times. But then, you know, it the, the you're getting out of the, the shallow end of the pool pretty soon. And then you're down in the deep end. And, I mean, it's very easy to say, you know, oh, this team's never going to lose. And there have been lots of teams that were never going to lose that have lost games. I mean, they have, uh, you know, I, I can do, I can give you a whole list of Ohio State teams that were never going to lose and then lost. So, you know, but but that's true of every program. Alabama has lost games that are like, what? How did you lose to that team? Georgia has lost games that were, were, how did you possibly lose to that team? Michigan, Michigan lost to TCU last year. And then TCU lost by 58 points the next week. I mean, you, you can lose games that you shouldn't lose that it doesn't take that much. It's college football. That's one of the things that makes it fun. So yeah, I don't, I don't look at anyone this year. I, frankly, I don't think the top of the sport is quite as good as it has been in a few different years in the past. It's, you know, there, there are good teams at the top, but I don't think there is the one dominant team that's absolutely steamrolling people like, like a 95 Nebraska or, you know, any of frankly the top two to three teams in 2019. I think this is just not, there is not that one incredibly dominant team this year. Super chat, Brady Lang. I'm an Ohio state alum and diehard fan, but G Scott arguably could have been called for a false start on Ohio State's game-winning touchdown. That is what ND fans were mad about. I have no recollection well, of that even being a conversation. Do you? Not really. Um, and the thing is, is that if uh, we're having to, you know, we're looking at that and we're having a hard time remembering that, um, I don't know. 
again, we see things like that happen all the time in games. So if, if, if the uh, South Bend newspaper guy thinks that that what makes the game controversial, then I'm sorry. I mean, that's, it is what it is. But again, when you throw around words like controversial or whatever, to me, that's more of a case of something really egregious. Hey, Tony, are you waving at me? Give me a thumbs up or thumbs down. All right, I'm bringing Tony back in, so let's talk nice about him. Hey, buddy, how you doing? All right. <laughs> did you miss me? I the, the kind of, I don't I do remember because um, I went back and looked, and G Scott did move, but I don't know that that's necessarily the big deal. I think it just comes down to you beat them with ten guys on the field, and should that count? And the answer still yes. So. um What's going on? Did do you do you think they um, do you think Michigan was asked about? Uh, I'm going to assume that they were to get Boy, to more, more detail. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, I, I'm going to try to go through some of this or all of this. The reason, obviously, Ohio State was number one was because of the strength of schedule and their their two wins, and also the win at Wisconsin. Um, but in terms of the Michigan thing, uh, so the uh, Ralph Russo from the AP asked a very interesting question because I'd forgotten that Ward Manuel is on the selection committee, the athletic director at Michigan. So they asked, um, were there any concerns about having him on the committee with the quote unquote controversy around Michigan right now? Of course, there, there are no there are no concerns regarding. Ward Manuel's position on the committee he was fully engaged the last couple of days, and he recuses himself whenever the Michigan come, topic comes up in terms of the ranking. But then Russo was like, "No, I, you know, like to clarify, like, is there a question of there's a question of credibility around Michigan right now? So, do you want that cloud of this question of credibility over the committee by having Ward Manuel on it? Like, he is tainting. Are you concerned that Ward Manuel's presence taints the committee?" because of his relationship with Michigan. And of course, you know, that does not, um, and the quote was, do you, do you want somebody who is high ranking at Michigan right now, part of the committee and uh, Boo said it just wasn't an issue and Ward Manuel has credibility. Dan Wolken from the USA Today asks about the, how the, the fact that the sign stealing stuff doesn't, didn't come up during the, any of the the rankings and that given that the committee also says that they were impressed with Michigan's level of domination, that's something that Boo Corrigan talked about with Michigan being ranked third. Basically, how can you not discuss whether or not that domination came from proper channels? Like you can be impressed with their, their domination, but how can you just ignore the whole sign stealing thing? And that maybe that the possibility of that having led to it and to which who uh, said uh, Michigan has played well all season. The NCAA is dealing with allegations only, and the committee makes judgments based on what happens on the field. And clearly Michigan has been a dominant team. So more of the head in the sand type of stuff in terms of, uh, you know, we don't even have the power to think any other way because we're going to rely on the NCAA for guidance on this one. And then um, the Detroit News, I believe uh, Angelique Shangelis, asked why the Michigan sign stealing wasn't part of the conversation. And the quote here is, you have to remember that these are allegations at this point and not facts. And so there is no substantive evidence that anything happened that might have affected the game. And that's basically the entire um, stance right now, that there's the the fact that Michigan has given up fewer touchdowns than any team in the past, I don't know, at least the past 15 years over the first eight games there's no substantive substantive evidence that anything they've done has helped them win any of their games in the fashion that they've done so. Okay, I mean we we yeah. talked about this well a little bit while you were gone. It it, it feels like the NCAA is not going to do anything because by statute they basically can't because of the timetables that they're on here. The CFP seems like they're not going to affirmatively do something. So it would come down to the Big Ten if the Big Ten wants to do something. And if the Big Ten wants to do something, that's going to come down to what comes out, what can you prove, how serious it is, what is the response from the other 13 members of the Big Ten. And, you know, then the great unknown, 
what does Tony Petiti do about, about all of it? Because we don't know anything about Tony Petiti other than he was the on the MLB uh, committee when the Astros got nuked for cheating. And, you know, there are some parallels here. So that that's one reason that I think maybe it's more likely than I would think otherwise that this could be something. But I still, uh, you know, I, I'm still in, I'll believe it when I see it, that the Big Ten is going to go out and, you know, say, actually, even though you went 12-0, and you don't get to play in the Big Ten championship game or whatever. I, that just, that feels like, it feels like he's in a very difficult position right now because he has 13 teams that sound like they're pretty angry and not very happy with him. And then you have one team that is probably going to sue you if you do anything uh, about it between now and then. So it's like, well, welcome to the show, kid. Good luck. We're all counting on you. Ohio State to the SEC, where the cheating is above board. Did you guys touch on this super chat? Holy cow. Rick no, Reese. we have several super chats to get to, but – Rick Reese, nice work, gentlemen, and tell Kevin he's making us dizzy with his ticking. Well, sitting here, as I, as I put in the chat, uh, my wife and one of her friends are downstairs passing out candy to little beggars right now, and I've been kicked upstairs to work in the bedroom with a bad back and nowhere to have any back support. So as I have back spasms, I'm doing it for you guys, including you, Rick, but thank you for the super chat. I've, <laughs> I'm trying not to be all over the place, but I'm, I'm obviously failing miserably. Let me get caught up on a couple of other super chats. Yeah, we had one that from tick, Michigan. That ticking, the ticking is actually just his spine being played like a xylophone. <laughs> Butch Jones, what time does a Connor Stallions news hour begin? And I said, Connor Stallions needs to stop doing stupid SHIT. And then, we, you know, we'll have less to talk about, but, uh, well, it, what did you guys think of the uh, the the private chat that I sent you? Did, did you did you talk about that openly? We have no? not. Uh, I don't oh, even okay. know if if, if 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 Tom has seen it. So go ahead and talk about oh, it, no, Mello. I... Mello, we'll get to your super chat here in a second. And Justice, you're on deck. Yeah, Mello number seven. Just because I haven't sent a super chat to you guys, and I've been watching forever. Go Bucks and uh, the rest of that. So thank you very much for chiming in with that i do wonder with this committee thing right now they're just relying on the fact that these are allegations and not facts how much fact is needed for them to begin to talk about it and is it uh like, like what fact would be enough to make them really act and if if it's just well you know yes they they admitted to stealing signs um, but everybody does it. Do, do they get back to the everybody does it thing until the way that it was, uh, the way these signs or signals were purloined becomes a part of public record. So I'm interested to see what happens when some of this becomes fact and, and how, who, who, who are the fact checkers? Is the NCA the ultimate arbiter of fact, or obviously the, the big 10 could, but clearly, clearly they're not going to, believe any newspaper reports or internet reports on any of this because that's that would require them to act and until they absolutely have to it doesn't seem like they want to well i mean the internet reports are based on the newspaper reports are based on something you know the washington post is not publishing an article without having that run through editors and fact checkers and probably attorneys as well so there's something there and you know the uh, the spin from michigan people has been like well it was this is being presented in the most unflattering possible light and like okay maybe what light are you presenting things in like that's this is kind of how this works so you know the question then becomes the stuff that that report was based on what do you have what can you prove what you know what can you bring forth in terms of you know, photos, video, whatever, to back up what you're saying. So this super chat from Justice Ferris, if Michigan gets wins revoked, would that make OSU the all-time wins leader? Does OSU's number one rank give them great CFP odds, even if they fall to Michigan? Um, is Ohio State like 25 wins behind them right now, something like that? I don't know the exact number. Um, 
So I don't know. One of you, one of you, something, something uh, like that. It's it's around. Yeah. It's in the twenties. Last time I looked. Um, so you're talking three did, seasons. And I was going to say I did see something on the uh, CFP telecast saying that the Big Ten had the greatest odds of any conference to put two in the playoff. Something that we talked about earlier, but not necessarily that number. I didn't really grab the number, but I think it was like 40%. It was, it was like way higher than I would have ever expected. But um, Ohio State has to carry the water the next three weeks or um, and, and hold on to that number one spot, in my opinion. So, you know, we'll see. Has anybody looked to see how, how often the, number, the first number one makes the, the actual playoffs? Have I was going yet? to do that today. I know, like, wasn't Mississippi State the number one team one year? Yeah. In, in 2014, I don't know that any – there was a long time when the first number one had never made the playoff or never won the national championship. I don't know if that's still true. Georgia might have been number one last year, maybe. I don't remember. Yeah, I mean, this is stuff I can do off air. I mean, uh, mm-hmm. don't have to do it right now um, while we're actually talking and doing a show. So this is, this is what Tony sent us because I had not seen this. Buckeyes for Life podcast says the photo photo of quote unquote Connor. This would be from the sidelines of the Central Michigan Michigan State game with the shades has a camera, and uh, this was something that Tony found on uh, Josh Pate's uh, Twitter account. There is there what Ray Bans or something that mm-hmm. uh, have a built in camera, and if you look at them next to what Connor Stallions is wearing, where he's wearing his sunglasses for a post sunset kickoff. Uh, I looked at those and thought, well, you're trying to be really, you know, you're trying to be real sneaky and you're trying to uh, not, um, you know, you're trying to not get caught, um, you know, because you're, you're in disguise because you're very sneaky. Uh, but boy, this is an intriguing possible uh, second explanation for this. I'm looking, um, not to change the subject, Tennessee was number one last year, the first number one. Did okay, anybody have that one? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, the, now the now the glasses thing, because you know Josh Pate, um, well known in in the, the 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 college football sphere to be talking about that. Um, that would be a new a new thing to discuss and this whole thing. And um, you know, am I here for it? Where else am I going to go? You know. Super chat from Super, Shane Johnson. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. I was just going to say, you guys keep pushing Big Ten intervene narrative. I get it because 1125, you are facing a three-peat with no excuses against a better team today in all three phases. I don't think any Ohio State fan is going to question about special teams because they're all ready to run the special <laughs> teams coach out on a rail. Um, okay, sure. I mean, we're just reporting the news that's being talked about. We're not we're not pushing any sort of intervene intervention narrative or whatever. Uh, we talk about it because this is an Ohio State channel, and that is what the Ohio State fan base would like to talk about. You have found an interest to come over and join us. Welcome, Shane, and your brethren and sisterin out there uh, who want to come in and see what Ohio State fans are, are talking about. We'll see what the game looks like when we get to it here in a couple few weeks. And hopefully both teams do take care of their own business. And we're looking at 11 and 0 versus 11 and 0. Well, and I think there's, it's been pushed very widely. Like the Michigan media has sought to make this whole thing about Ohio state and, you know, Ohio state is driving this whole thing and all that. And I've seen a lot more proof about the Connor stallions thing than I have about the Mm -hmm. Ohio state, you know, side of things. It's kind of like, well, this guy has a brother. Oh, okay. Well, you had me at brother, I guess. it's not like Ohio State is the only school that's ticked off about this right now. Like this is not this is not an Ohio State versus Michigan thing. This is a a lot of college football teams are pretty ticked at Michigan it seems like right now because there seems to be more and more stuff coming out. 
And, you know, I'm sure there are still people who are spinning it as hamburgers or whatever the hamburgers equivalent for this is. But the reality is there is a growing amount of evidence around a lot of this stuff and new stuff continues to come out every day. So, you know, when we get asked what might be done about it, the answer is the Big Ten is the only entity that might do something about it. We don't know. That's not us pushing. That's not us saying, oh, please, Big Ten, you must do us. Save us, Tony Padini, Juan Kenobi. You're our only hope. That's not what we're saying. We're saying when people ask what, what's going to be done, we say, well, this is the only entity that might do something. Will they do something? We don't know. There are a lot of a lot of variables still to play, still to play out. Like, the Ohio State scared narrative is one of the dumber ones that's out there right now. Yeah, there's a lot the of dumb we, ones, but but that's the one of the dumber ones. Yeah, the reason we talk about the Big Ten is because that's that's the most likely intervention, and that we know how slowly the NCAA acts. Mark Feder super chat. Just want to say thanks to you guys. Thank you very much, Mark, for the super chat. So I did go through and I looked. And uh, at all of the number one, the, the the first number ones in the CFP poll, and there are have been uh, Ohio State is now the tenth. Just so uh, just so we know, this is the tenth year of the CFP. Do you know, guys, how many times the initial number one team has not made the playoffs? I'm going to say. Well, it's so it's out of nine years because this is the tenth. I'm right, going to yeah. say six. I'll say four. Twice. Oh, last year, you, you Tennessee didn't make the playoffs. Probably would have oh. if Hendon Hick Hooker doesn't get injured, or if there wasn't somebody on the sideline to make sure that Tennessee lost. And then, and then and in Mississippi 20, State, 2014, mm-hmm. Mississippi State, hmm. the first, the initial number one there so pretty good place to be people say well you know number one team doesn't necessarily win it um i did not like to see who was winning it winning it i just looked to see who was in it ohio state was the initial number one in 2019 as well Uh, georgia has been the initial number one twice bama has been the initial number one three times clemson once and never again wow I don't think we're going to see Clemson vying for top four anytime mm-hmm. soon as where that program is going right now in terms of their trajectory at the moment. So let me did. I don't, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying this. I've seen other people say this, that Ohio state broke Clemson broke Dabo. I don't think it was Ohio state. I think it was transfer portal, NIL, all of these other things, but you, you could have Ohio State fans claiming Clemson. I do believe Ohio State broke Miami, and that I, that is so factual it should be in Wikipedia. But uh, <laughs> you know, not too bad to have uh, perhaps two uh, two programs like that. Oh, oh, breaker of chains. Here you go, Tom. Wingman Ted says, "I feel like Stallions deserves Tom's SEC voice. I don't know the guy, but the voice seems to." Act- so does that mean that Ooh, we don't know if he's southern? Like my SEC voice. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know if he's southern. Tom, can you no, do he's a from. Accent? Can I do a, a Uper a accent? Uper? Yeah. yeah, not not a good one. Not that that's ever stopped me before with anything else, but no. Why couldn't this man be Australian? Southern Australian, crikey, the best kind. <laughs> Well, in typical fashion, our biggest numbers are here at the end of the show. But, you know, I want to thank everybody. This isn't me saying goodbye yet, but over 500 people here. And we've been carrying four to 500 for most of the show. And we'll be doing this every Tuesday for the college football playoff reveals. And yeah, Tony and, also and I have been carrying up. one for years on this show. I I wasn't going to say anything. LFG saying Stallions is from Michigan. Um <laughs> <laughs> time with the point uh what no nothing kevin uh do do want to encourage all of you to check us out at buckeyehuddle.com if you are not yet a member now is a fantastic time to do that uh, have you guys just been hammering i saw i was i would i would watch a little bit while i was on the call and see you guys were talking constantly so that's good always always want to be talking during a live stream that is fantastic great job you took the tips well the lessons that i've taught you all so well 
Well, talking beats yeah. dancing. We avoided the awkward silences like a middle school dance, like Kevin and I just standing on opposite sides of a live stream, just kind of looking at each other and then looking at our shoes. Yeah, it was we, – we've you gotten better like, over the years. Each other. The final two hours I, I think, of our drive back from Wisconsin where everybody was just too tired to even try. <laughs> And I, I see some new names in the chat here. So if you guys are new and you're enjoying this, we do a bunch of other content, obviously, during the course of the week. This is not the only show we do. We do a live post-game show after every Ohio State game here on our channel, youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. We do a bunch of – we do uh, multiple daily podcasts because somehow people keep watching. Uh, so Tony and I do the Buckeye Weekly podcast. That's, despite its name, a daily podcast during the season. I do the Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning podcast, which, despite its name, comes out at night. We're really bad at branding. Kevin does the Big Me kickoff because his last name is Noon. Get it? Because it's a big me. So uh, so you can find all that at YouTube.com slash Buckeye Huddle and at BuckeyeHuddle.com as well. And uh, if you enjoy talking with us, uh, you can become a member there at BuckeyeHuddle.com. And you can find us all. We have the Huddle Board presented by Jeff Ruby Steakhouse where we answer questions. We have a whole team of uh, insiders covering the team, covering recruiting, covering X's and O's, making everyone a smarter football fan. Uh, so that is all at BuckeyeHuddle.com. It's disappointing that Kevin has the most accurate podcast name, but that's just because ours are so inaccurate. It's not that Kevin's is accurate. It's just ours is so inaccurate, especially one time you're recording. We're, we're doing a live Buckeyes tomorrow morning at 1 p.m., the day before, I mean, it's, it's a bit There's much. nothing worse than after a long day of covering a game and doing the post-game show, and then Tom says, all right, time to record the morning morning show, and then I just see speed lines as Tony is going full Jesse Owens, running out of the room. I just, uh, just a low light of my week. Here's super chat from Jordan Kapler. Tremendous, tremendous question. The only true way for Ohio State and Michigan to settle this is for both Day and Harbaugh to play quarterback in the game. Who wins? Now, this is so interesting because Harbaugh obviously played in the NFL for quite a while. Day was an FCS quarterback at New Hampshire. Day also like 15 years younger. And, and I mean, I feel like... E -ridden. Well, I feel like you might lean towards the youth here like if i think about how much younger i felt 15 years ago like that feels like that might be the deciding factor so yeah i i think i might lean day here just based on the fact that he's i i mean harbaugh graduated college in what 1987 six something like that and day didn't graduate until 2000 or so so i i think that's i think that's my deciding factor there I well, think, we also know I, that Ryan Day is a home run champion during recruiting uh, recruiting events, and we still have never asked him about that. Yeah, well, there, there's other things going on, but I do eventually want to ask him about that. But, yeah, I think um, from the time you are actually 15 years old, being 15 years younger is than somebody you're going against is almost always an advantage, except for maybe the NFL immediately. But, like, in anything uh, – once you're 15 years younger than than your opponent, you're probably in a, in a good spot. Like even if you're 70 facing an 85 year old, I'm going to take the 70 year old. And here the same with like a 40, 42 year old and a 57 year old. I don't know something like that. Um, no offense, Kevin. <laughs> I generally don't listen to you, so I don't know what you said. So it's okay. Sorry, I was just looking on in horror at the Toledo Buffalo game where there is snow on the field. It looks like if you have been to Northwest Ohio, and I know that the three of us all have, there is a winter dry cold that is just so much colder than whatever the temperature says it is. And they just had a dunk tank on the sideline and had some girl go in the dunk tank. I... I like recoiled in horror. So if you, if you rewind this show about a minute and a half and you're wondering why I look like I just saw something for out of the saw movies, that's, that's why like you couldn't pay me to do that. It no matter what you had. Oh my goodness. Oh, geez. All right. <laughs> oh, uh, grabbing, no. grabbing no. the remote. 
and Jersey Mike's is sponsoring this. <laughs> pneumonia brought to you by Jersey Mike. <laughs> Get it Mike's way with pneumonia. <laughs> I'd, I'd rather be having a steak at Mancy's than be hanging out at this cold game. And that's that's for you, El Suzabo. I know you're on. You're watching us on the show and talking about Toledo. We have a lot of great people in the chat that are from T Town and the neighboring areas. I never could find the dunk tank, but I that's fine. I I don't need to see those types of. I don't watch injuries and I don't watch stuff like that. It's like knockerball. I love knockerball. Knockerball is fantastic. And if you're if you're wondering what's knockerball. Uh, it is the one of the things they do during timeouts at Ohio Stadium where they have people with like big inflatable, basically gerbil balls on them, but they're just inflatable and they run across the field at high speed and crash into each other. And it is the greatest spectacle in all of sports. And I cannot believe it is not part of the 2028, uh, 2028 Summer Olympics. I don't know Ooh. what they're thinking. They're doing flag football. Maybe knockerball won't be too far behind. Uh, comment from Cheesy. Uh, he's Buckeye in Florida. Love your all's content. The utter arrogance from Michigan denying everything. Having the FBI and NCAA on site at the same time, uh, there's an issue. That is interesting. Um, do they do they rent like condo side by side and just hang out after work and go over notes with the the FBI talking to the NCAA and things like that? Um, you never you never want one of those on your campus looking at you. You certainly don't want two of those. And I don't think either of them are going away anytime soon from based on the way things are going and the way things keep dripping out. And, um, you know, who knows, who knows what tomorrow will bring, but I'm sure it, it means nothing and that it's all, this is good news for Michigan. Like I, like Jim Harbaugh's contract being extended or, adjusted is all good news for Michigan, even if there is some verbiage thrown in there about easier ways to fire you for cause, you know, something like that. If that gets thrown in there, that will be still a win for Michigan, win for Jim Harbaugh somehow. But eventually, this this is not leading anywhere good. Odysseus, knockerball, Tony versus Tom, who wins? I think the International Knockerball Federation needs to set some real rules because – like what we see during the game is like a tag team type of situation, like a, like a relay race where you have to do four, like, you know, run the, run the width of the field four times or whatever. Um, first of all, I'm not sure if anybody here is wanting to run the width of the field four times, but if we're just talking one, one running start, one go, who takes the worst who takes the worst spill or who delivers the worst hit, I guess. Well, I, I think everybody's just going to go flying. Like nobody's going to stay upright. So it doesn't, it doesn't feel like there's ever a real winner in knocker ball. Like I have are. a lot of pictures. I have a lot of pictures where people just go like <laughs> they, they crash and then they just go and they both like flip and go out, out of, um, you know, they both like I have a lot of pictures where you have two sets of legs facing up and like in opposite directions. I, you know, I always assume this is a low man wins situation, but I don't, I don't know if there is a winner in knocker ball. It's just, you lose slightly less. Plus Kevin, as we know, uh, Tom has trouble running on the field and staying upright just by running. As the as the guy with the there's bad a, back right now, cut. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> there's a deep cut for you. Yes, if you stayed up for the very end of our uh, post game show for Wisconsin, yes. Uh, well, you got to go now. You have to go watch another. There's your homework. Go watch another video. Uh, look, look at this question from Ross Reinhardt. <laughs> did Tom used to write Tom's tip sheet? In fact, I did used to write Tom's tip sheet. Yes, that is. So this is a um, whoops. Deep cut. This is a. Um, oh, well, the show is better for a minute. Um, yeah, so back in 2002, I wrote for a website called The Ozone, and uh, it was basically the first Ohio State site. It was founded in October. I, actually, happy birthday, Ozone. It was ended oh, October 31st, yeah. 1996. Happy birthday, Ozone, Ooh. founded by the great John Parentis, still a good friend That's of the program. Um, 
we uh, it, so you know October thirty first, nineteen ninety six. This is like early, early days of the internet. Uh, like an absolute pioneer in this space. And uh, I started, I met John when I was a Lantern beat reporter for baseball in 2000 and uh, got to be good friends with him and ended up writing for him a little bit after I graduated. And one of the things I started writing in the 2002 season was probably right around this time of year when it was, you know, it was the BCS and it was, you know, hey, what does Ohio State need to do to get into the national championship game? Because Ohio State was undefeated, but had not been particularly inspiring and was stuck behind a bunch of other teams. So it was just a weekly run through of, okay, here's the games to watch. Who's playing point spread, a little you know note on the game and who you should be rooting for. And uh, he called it Tom's tip sheet. And then uh, when I, Tony, Tony, at some point a few years later started, like he was just some guy on the message board who was funny. And uh, so we started and eventually like writing that together every week. And then I left to go take another job that was a conflicting media thing. So I couldn't do it anymore. So that it became Tony's tip sheet. And uh, no one, no one except for this one wonderful, wonderful man, I think remembers that it was originally mine. And Tony has just been drafting off of me for 20 something years. Well, I will say for about two years, it was called not Tom's tip sheet. So <laughs> we did keep your memory alive. Even as John kept saying, no, 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 Tom's gone. We don't need to put his name on it anymore. And I was like, no, we're doing it. But I started Michigan Monday. <laughs> that is also not true. Uh, that was uh, that was 2004, I'm going to say. I started writing the Michigan Monday column. And uh, there was, boy, there's been a lot of years when that has just been there have been a lot of years when Michigan fans did not read that. I can tell you that that was very it was very popular with Ohio State fans for a while, uh, and then uh, very popular. And, well, I mean, more popular with Michigan fan Ohio State fans than Michigan fans. Tony Tony got to do it during the Rich Rod era, which was oh, glorious. Uh, what a time to be alive! I started Script Ohio, but you know that's just a little known fact. That came from Michigan. <laughs> Um, are we are we caught up? Are we? Uh... I think so. We've gone an hour forty five. We still have four hundred hearty souls, and I'm starting oh, well. to have internet issues. So I must. I, I need to put another quarter in the router or something. No, that will do. We don't want to set a precedent of going two hours every single Tuesday night because then it becomes ah, eh, oh, let's go two no. thirty. Uh, so we do want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, as always, and like I said, you'll find us here every Tuesday night. Sometimes uh, at this time, other times, depending on uh, when the rankings do get released. Uh, the, the, uh, the Avalos with the Super Chat, thank you very much. Go Bucks on that Super Chat. We do appreciate everybody pitching in, everybody tuning in, everybody giving a thumbs up. And if you have not yet subscribed to our YouTube channel, please do so. And again, I invite you to subscribe to BuckeyeHuddle.com. Become a member there. Check us out. It's a great way. Uh, and it's another way for you to support what we do. And we do appreciate that. So thank you all for tuning in tonight and we will talk to you all later.